Okay, welcome back again. So <clears throat> this is the, will be the video lecture to accompany uh, lecture two, which is on Adam Smith, uh, and this will be the first part. So there'll probably be well, there's already a second one because I've I've made it. Um, I'm guessing I was thinking originally three lectures on Smith, but or sorry, three parts on Smith, uh, but I'm thinking now it's going to be four. Um, so this will be the first part of those four, right? So we'll try to keep these relatively short, right? Now there's a lot in Adam Smith, and really it's a, um, it's a, I mean, it's a great book, right? So, so ever you know everybody knows that title, Wealth of Nations, and everybody knows the name Adam Smith. Well, certainly if you're an economist, you you know those, right? Or even, you know, loosely connected with economics, you should you should know those. And uh, it's good to have a, well, first of all, I would really encourage you to read at least, at least the first six chapters of book one of the, of the Wealth of Nations. And um, that's certainly the part that gets the most press. So when people are talking about Adam Smith's and Adam Smith's ideas, you know, most of what they're talking about is in those first six books. And, and that's not a lot of reading, right? That's, that's, you know, but less I should grab my it's on the shelf there behind me. Should I grab it and look? But I believe that's less than a hundred pages. Okay, so now the wealth of nations as a whole is is let's say about five hundred pages. So there's a lot more to it than just these first six books, right? And uh, where Smith goes from there later on is is uh, to introduce a lot of nuance nuance into the argument. There's a lot of sort of there's a lot of history in there too. Um, yeah, it expands upon on upon most of what can be found in the first six six chapters. So uh, you certainly get the crux of, of his argument by reading by reading that. And it's really not that I mean it's old timey language, right? Because it's published originally in 1776. Generally today you find the edition that was published in a I want to say 1789, somewhere thereabouts, which was the final one during Smith's lifetime. Uh, but but compared to other work from that era, uh, it's really a very easy read. Smith is a is a pretty good writer. Um, in fact, he's one of the best writers we'll read in this class. Economists, by and large, aren't aren't great writers. <laughs> um, but Smith is pretty good. Smith is pretty good. He even cracks a joke once in a while and, and, and generally you, you can even get his jokes whereas you know 350 year old jokes often don't translate well um, and I think you'll find uh, I would encourage this so, so a lot of people um, have a lot of biases as they interject and dismiss work um, I mean I, I'll talk about it in class but I have a, I have a good story to go along with that um, but it's maybe <clears throat> too long for these these lectures um, but you know, Smith is kind of uh, two-dimensionalized into this sort of uh, um, grandfather of of, of uh, laissez-faire uh, uh, capitalism. Often, you know, by people on the relative left of of Western politics, and 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 often heralded as a. Uh, sort of a, a beacon uh, by by those in the you know more right all of that those terms are losing their meaning these days right I used to be able to say that stuff 10 years 15 years ago but not today so we think about the you know the, the right in the United States maybe 20 30 years ago Adam Smith was frequently held up as really a, a, a bastion of, 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 of sort of relatively right is thinking in, in American politics and and that really wasn't correct either. Um, you know, Adam Smith is much more uh, sophisticated and nuanced as a thinker than to really be easily pigeonholed. And no matter where you're coming from uh, in your own politics, I would encourage you to give Smith a try because he's um, he's worth your time, right? He's worth your time. All right. So without going any further, I'm going to dig into. Uh, dig into the beginnings of Smith and this section this um, lecture is really uh, the first four chapters 
of, of book one of the Wealth of Nations. And uh, uh, is, is the essence of, of his answer to, to that question. So let's get in there. So the full title of Smith's book just going to change that window there. The full title of Smith's book is An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Right? So we usually get the last part, Wealth of Nations, but if you look at the cover of the book, that, that's what the cover says. Okay, so, so what is it, right? Well, this is Smith's attempt at an economic science, right? So he's going to, he's going to try to figure out like the cause and effect of nations being wealthy or having a functional and successful economy. And, you know, as we've talked a little bit already with the mercantilists, this is, this is not the first attempt to do that. Uh, Sir James Stewart's book, which came out about, I want to say in 1767, it's, like, it's about 10 years before Wealth of Nations, is probably the first one to do that. But uh, this is quite a ways... Uh, I'm trying to stay away from the word better, right? <laughs> They're different, right? They're maybe one's maybe not better or worse than the other, but um, certainly Smith is much more readable uh, uh, and uh, probably hangs together logically a little better um, than than Sir James Stewart's uh, book. So so Smith is writing, uh, you know, in the 1770s here in the first edition and uh, trying to come up with a sort of scientific explanation for why economies succeed or don't, right? Um, and he really takes a very different approach from uh, the mercantilists, or, or what we're calling the mercantilists. By the way, Smith coined that term, mercantilists. And um, so maybe, maybe, you know, mercantilists would not have called themselves that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Smith sort of saw the mercantilist as all these sort of, uh, um, well, he didn't view them in a very high regard. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, read Smith, and I think you'll, you'll um, he's much more sophisticated than he's almost always given credit for. So <clears throat> anyway, so Smith totally changes gears from the mercantilists, right? First of all, he's going to take a systematic approach to economics. So he's going to think about things in cause and effect, right? Terms, whereas you know, mercantilists, there's no systematic thinking. It's just, you know, we're, you know, get more money, right? <laughs> uh, but here we have to think about, okay, when we get more money, where is that going to come from? And if I take it from there, what effects might that have in turn, right? So we're going to think about these systematically in terms of cause effect, effect cause, cause effect, cause effect, so on and so forth. All right. Second, whereas earlier economic thinkers, um, well, particularly mercantilists, you know, go, go back further, you know, to sort of religious documents and things like that. They're really talking about real economic activity too. But Smith is Smith here is talking about real economic activity. So he's talking about wealth as as standard of living, right? So when he talks about wealth, he's not talking about money wealth. He's talking about standard of living. So he's trying to figure out where, you know, where does that come from? Where do we get this? So writing in England, well, more technically Scotland in the 1770s, why is uh, Scotland, England, or, or the what's now the UK, right? Now, why, why are these economies relatively um, good when compared to other economies that, that Smith would have and did, does point to, uh, such as southern the economies of Southern Europe, even the economy of Spain, right, which is pretty nearby to England, um, or the French economy? Uh, you know, why why are they doing relatively well uh, when compared uh, to the other economies in terms of standard of living? terms of standard of living. Okay. The third thing that makes Smith special, and here he's really the first um, in this regard, is he's writing for a general audience, right? So he's, you know, he's just writing for anybody who wants to pick up this book and learn about economics. It's not written for kings, it's not written for princes, 
It's not lit written for leaders of industry. Okay, it's, I mean, those people can certainly read this, right? Right. It's not too exclusive, but it's, uh, you know, it's written for anybody who wants to pick it up. It's written for a general audience. And then finally, is there, there's a serious attempt to be logically consistent. Uh, so it's written as one, it's supposed to be one cohesive statement uh, on, on, on economics. And so that's really a pretty serious achievement, right? Um, if you think about where this is starting from, what other people are saying at the time, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty path breaking. All right, so onwards. So what is the source of the wealth nation? This is Smith's fundamental question, right? So this is his, his investigation, right? So if he's a scientist, you know, what causes the heart to beat? What causes people to live longer? What, you know, what, so his question is, what makes for improvements in the standard of living? Okay. And <clears throat> His argument, right, it, well, we're going to summarize it very briefly here, right, which is somewhat unfair because it's more nuanced than, than, than what we're going to be able to say here. But, but his argument is that that wealth comes from the productive capacity of the land, but much more importantly, from the productive capacity of a nation's labor. In other words, the wealth of nations comes from who? The wealth of nations comes from the productivity of the populace. Okay, that's a very different idea from mercantilist thinking. It's a very different uh, way of thinking, really, than, than almost anything that precedes it. Um, it's, as I've used this word in class a couple times, it is really the beginning of liberal economics, or you know, the economics of, of the individual. Right, individual choices and individual action. And uh, that may seem a trivial matter today, but uh, you know at the time it was quite significant. Um, at the time you, you generally talked about the, the wealth of nation states, right? Um, not really kind of you know what Joe Schmo's life looks like when he, when he comes home from work. What Jane Schmo's life looks like you know when she, gets back from doing the things she needs to do all day. What does her day look like from sunrise to sunset? But that's the economics of Smith, okay? Um, <clears throat> and Smith says that, right, the greater productivity yields more material output for a given amount of effort, right? That's what, that's what productivity means. That's what Smith means by it. And productivity is something that doesn't just happen Right, it's developed. So, similarly, there's things that can wreck productivity too. We'll talk about both those in, in turn. Uh, so, as a consequence, if productivity is something is developed, and productivity is what makes nations wealthy, then of course the question is how was productivity developed? Which is what Adam Smith is going to tell you, <laughs> right? So, so this stuff here is like page one. Book, chapter one, book one of Wealth of Nations. Right? Okay. So the first chapter of book one of the Wealth of Nations is entitled The Division of Labor. Okay, so that's where the book starts off. Right? The book starts off with this idea of what I just said about productivity. And it's okay, so where does productivity come from? Smith's answer, division of labor. Now, we, you can read what's on this slide, right? And you've probably heard that term of division of labor before. Division of labor is just people doing different tasks to produce a given item. Now, Smith was talking about what we call intra-firm division of labor, intra-firm division of labor. So that's if we take a given product, like say this Pepsi can here, we have a whole bunch of workers that are in various steps doing small items like, you know, this lid is going to be stamped out separately from the, the side, right? which is, we can see it's one piece with the bottom, right? So the, the forming of this can is going to be a separate process from the forming of this lid. That separation of tasks by two different workers would be an example of a division of labor. Okay, you can also look at my glasses we have here, right? So you generally buy frames separate from the lenses. The lenses are generally made right 
you know, right where you're buying them because they're done to prescription or somewhere nearby. Uh, and it's a very different person who makes the lenses than who makes the glasses, right? So the end product, glasses, that process is divided up into several steps and then split across different workers. Smith says, okay, that's where productivity comes from. All right, why? Smith gives re three reasons, right? First one, by separating tasks, <clears throat> it leads to improved dexterity. The thinking being here, if I only do one thing, I learn to do it very well, okay? Because I do it over and over again, so I get very good at doing it. I don't waste time. I know exactly what needs to be done. I make use of the exact movements that need to occur to get the task done. And as I continue to do that, as I become increasingly specialized, I'm going to improve in that. And that's a very um, basic way of thinking about this first idea, right? We can think about it maybe in less contrived terms. I mean, Smith's example of a pin factory, which you know, you'll know you read it and Blau talks about it, is a good one, right? But we can think about it like this. You know, so, so right now you're receiving specialized training in at least business or something like that, or if not economics. Um, well, let's just to say a couple of you are, are, are math too, but you're receiving specialized training in sort of the technical aspects of, of economy, right? For lack of a better term, sort of capture all those things. And you're not learning a bunch of other things. You know, you're not learning how to uh, fillet a fish, or or debone a fish, right? You know, you know, I don't know how to do those things, right? <laughs> People go fishing a lot, and they're like, oh, I, deep, yeah, I have no idea what they're talking about, right? That's not not my thing at all. Um, me not having to do those things or not learning about those things gives me time, frees up time for me to learn about the things that. That, that I'm specialized in, right? So, you know, if I grab here, this is my evening reading book, right? So it's econometrics, <laughs> um, right? So, so that, so I'm not learning about fishing. I'm, I'm learning about that. Now, you know, I, I do learn about some, you know, it's like guitar and stuff, and organs here in the background. Like that's kind of fun learning for me, right? But uh, I'm specialized in a certain, certain few things, right? Which allows me to be relatively good at those things. Uh, as opposed to if I'd learn how to do everything, right? I don't know how to make these clothes. N no idea. <laughs> okay, so that's the first one. Second, right, Smith points to time savings, right? So anybody, any of you who have ever, uh, you know, if you have a job either on campus or off campus, right, you go from like class to your job, particularly if it's off campus. You know, when I, when I was a student, I worked at a liquor store and I would go to classes in like, you know, the morning, right? And then I would go work the evening shift at the liquor store. And nobody else there was in, ever went to college or was in college or anything like that, right? And, and I would have my books and I'd be working on assignments in the evening. And, and it was just brutal, right? Because nobody around would appreciate like why I had to do this. Like, why are you wasting your time with that nonsense? Shifting from one type of work to another type of work is not only physically jarring in the sense that you're moving from one set of physical operations to another, but it's mentally jarring too. Okay, and Smith recognizes both of these, right? Both the physical and mental. So okay, if you're not changing tasks regularly, you don't have that sort of ramp up time needed to get into a new mode of thinking associated with a new task. Finally, Smith points to sort of what we might call uh, some of the learning by doing effects where specialization also yield or sorry uh, encourages the use of more specialized machinery this one's maybe a little harder to understand you know how does machinery come about from specialization but you know it's the obvious way like here we have a bunch of people uh, I don't know what they're doing exactly in that picture there <laughs> they're doing something right um, but if you're just doing one task then it's it's relatively easy to design a machine to do one task uh, rather than design a machine that does several tasks. That's sort of the most straightforward way of thinking about it, but that's not only what Smith meant. In fact, more importantly, Smith thought that if you kept doing the same thing over and over again, you'll start developing tools to do that task. Okay, so, you know, 
for me it's it's working on engines and things like that uh for you it, it might be some other you know maybe if you like cooking you know you, you cook something over and over again but but i know right if i'm doing job x i know exactly what tools i need to put out lay out right and oftentimes i've modified those tools to do the job i need to do them better right so i've actually changed the tools or made new tools because i know how to do that specific task very well and i know what type of tools can help me to do it even better than I would otherwise be able to do it. That's what Smith's talking about. Okay. So in all three of these cases, what do we have? We have an arrow sort of the, that points to here, right? Human productivity is really a function of our being able to put our intellect towards the betterment of production. And that's where the wealth of nations comes from. All right, so here's our three things that you need to productivity. All right, let's keep rolling. <clears throat> okay, so, all right, division of labor leads to these increases in productivity, and then increases in productivity lead to increases in wealth. Okay, awesome, right? That's the argument so far. Where does the vision of division of labor come from? <laughs> okay, right? So that's the next step, right? So systematic thinking, right? As opposed to sort of, you know, just get gold. What's gold good for? Stuff, right? No. Okay, so what are we trying to do here? Improve the standard of living. Smith says, okay, great. How do you do that? Increase productivity. Great. How do you do that? Division of labor. Great. How do you do that? Okay, that's where we are right now. So Smith argues that the division of labor arises as a result of human nature. <laughs> okay, so... This is the next line here is his specific line in, in the Wealth of Nations. Truck, barter, and exchange. Okay. Whew. I want you to take a step back and think about that for a second. I'll say it again just so, just so you remember. So, Wealth of Nations comes from where? Productivity. Advancements of productivity. Productivity comes from where? Division of labor. Division of labor comes from where? Human nature. Okay, so what do we have? The wealth of nations is a function of the freeing of individuals to pursue their nature. So it's liberal, as I keep saying, liberal. Allow the individual to do what they would. The division of labor will arise. A division of labor will lead to an increase in productivity. An increase in productivity will lead to a real increase in the wealth of nations. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this human nature. So Smith makes the argument that people want to trade stuff right, as part of their nature. Why do they want to trade stuff? Because they like stuff. Okay, so what is their, in, what is their ultimate interest that we're allowing them to pursue? The fact that they like stuff and that they like different stuff. They like stuff that they can make and they like some of the stuff that they can't make too. So if you just let them go ahead and do their thing, they'll make stuff and then the extra stuff they have that they don't want, they'll trade it away for the stuff that they do want. Okay. So that is so far the essence of Smith's argument. All right, let's work it back the other way. Okay. People like stuff. People like a wide variety of stuff. People can't make a wide variety of stuff. Therefore, they'll trade stuff. As a result of their wanting to trade stuff, a division of labor will arise. As a result of the division of labor arising, there will be an increase in productivity. As a result of the increase in productivity, there'll be an increase in the real wealth of nations, of all individuals within that society. That's the argument. Okay. If you didn't get that, pause it and get it, well, rewind it again. Because important <laughs> okay so <clears throat> all right so here what's the deal like that sounds like just like a cumulative process that will occur on its own naturally right so like why are some nations ahead of others <laughs> okay right <laughs> right so so far okay well smith says hey well that's not there all there's to it there's things that stop all that stuff from happening right so i just went through the the steps right Okay, go back and rewind and go watch it again if you don't have all those steps, right? 
but there's things that stop those things as well, stop those steps from happening. Okay, so Smith makes the case, and there's a, there's a famous phrase here, Smith says, so you'll, you'll hear this, you've probably heard this quote before, but you, it just went like whatever, you know, and now next time you hear it, you would be like, oh yeah, I know what that's all about. The division of labor is everywhere and always limited by the extent of the market. Okay, that's the quote from Smith, right? If you read the first six chapters, like I've recommended, you'll find it. I want to say it's in chapter four, but I don't quote me on that. So what does that mean, right? Well, what Smith is talking about is the division of labor is limited by how big the aggregate set of markets is. That can be a difficult concept to understand. It's easy to hear it and think like, oh, I know what that is. But then this is, this is totally one of those things when it comes to a test, you'd be like, I have no idea what that is when somebody asks you to explain it. So try to explain it to somebody else after you're done watching this video. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we're all living in Eau Claire. For, for, well, we're not all living in Eau Claire. Most of us in our class are living in Eau Claire. And if, if not, we're all going to school in Eau Claire, right? Some of you are at distance, right? Eau Claire is a small city. It's, you know, even the whole metro area is only just over 100,000 people. Okay. So we don't have a lot of things in Eau Claire. If you want to, you know, buy uh, groceries like you would buy in India at an Indian grocery store, we don't have one of those. Okay. Uh, if you want to... Uh, well, the problem I have frequently, if you want to buy specialized parts for your old Italian motorcycles, eh, we don't have a shop that sells those here in Eau Claire. <laughs> uh, if you want to get your old Italian motorcycles repaired here in Eau Claire, nah, forget about it. There's only one person who knows how to do that. That's me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things we don't have in Eau Claire. And if you go to a smaller town, some of you may be from, from some of the smaller towns here in Wisconsin, you, you have less things even, right? Maybe there's no mall at all. Maybe there's no, uh, you know, generally Walmarts are sort of everywhere, right? But, you know, you know maybe there's no uh, uh, even local grocery store. You have to drive to the next big town to get to a grocery store. Well, those are limitations in the market, okay? Division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. I go to a big city, I can find all kinds of specialized things because the market's broad and it allows for more and more specialized markets to exist. In a big city, I can have an Indian grocery store because in the United States, right? Because I've got enough people from India or enough people who are interested in food from India to support that business at its minimum efficient scale. Okay. You know, Claire, I don't. There simply aren't enough people for, for that grocery store to exist as a profitable enterprise. In a smaller town yet, right? A smaller town yet, there may not be enough people for a single grocery store even to operate efficiently with, at a profit. So the market is gonna be very limited and the division of labor as a consequence is also gonna be very limited. Okay, so you can see like that's, that's something that people still like, all the time people tell me like, oh, Claire needs a Whole Foods, right? Or, or something like that, right? Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, they love that. I want a Trader Joe's and Eau Claire. It's not big enough. <laughs> Eau Claire isn't big enough uh, to have those types of things. Yeah, you you know, you and your friends want to go there, but you know what? The, the 25 of you, you know, you're just not enough to keep that business going. Um, so this is what Smith, Smith means. All right, so let's think of some things besides population that would limit the market. Okay. Smith points in, so this is in 1770s, right? So we can see already, you know, book one, chapter one, the argument is getting <laughs> pretty sophisticated. Um, Smith points to population, which we've already discussed why that would limit the market, right? If you live in an area with not a lot of people, you're not going to have a lot of division of labor. Uh, you know, if we, if this university didn't draw from all over the world, you know, how many, how many economists do we really need in Eau Claire? maybe a dozen at the most, right? Within specialization of economics, you know, like how many uh, you know, labor economists does Eau Claire need? <laughs> maybe one, 
you know, okay, how many does Kadat need? You know, it's a small town outside this land. None. They don't need any, right? They don't need any of those. So population is certainly going to division, the division of labor. It's very straightforward. Geography, okay. Uh, this is the picture on this slide here is of a sextant, which was a major innovation in, in, in maritime trade because it allowed you to navigate over the high seas using the stars uh, as guideposts. Prior to the invention of the sextant, uh, maritime trade sort of just bopped along the coasts. So you'd, you'd always keep the coast in sight. Which, if you know ships, here I'm going to go ship nerd for a little while, right? So just, you know, deal with it. <laughs> right? so if you've ever been on a boat, right, the left is port, right? And the right is starboard, okay? Okay, here's why. The shore is on your left. The ocean is on your right with the stars, <laughs> okay? Because you're always in sight of the shore. Once the sextant is invented, that thing there you see in the picture, you can navigate across the open ocean, no land in sight, using the stars as guideposts to which direction you're going. And what that invention opens up is it opens up global maritime trade. Right? So, so now you don't have to sort of bop along the coast and take forever to get from one place to the other. You can travel directly over the high seas. And so what that does is open up all kinds of geography to trade that didn't exist before. As a consequence, this aggregate size of the market expanded tremendously. And as a consequence, the division of labor expanded tremendously. And we can see that that idea of geography here is being combined with the next item, technology. And so Smith in, I, I don't want to say this is chapter seven now, now Smith talks about uh, maritime navigation in England and how that has led to a great expansion in the side of the mark size of the market and then in turn leads to a, led to a great expansion in the division of labor which in turn is a major contributing factor to the wealth of that nation okay so nations that don't develop as effective technology or don't can't access the same geography or population simply aren't going to be as wealthy in Smith's explanation as those that can. Okay, so now we have an explanation for disparities in the wealth of nations. Okay, they're right, they're right there, right? They're right there. All right, so <clears throat> let's take all those things and put it together. This is, this is what you're thinking, like, how long is Kemp going to yammer on here? Okay, we're pretty much at the end, right? Okay, so here's the model so far. One, people like stuff. Okay. Two, to get more diverse stuff, they trade with others. Three, from trade, markets develop. Four, from markets, a division of labor develops. Five, division of labor improves productivity. Six, improved productivity yields increased real wealth. All right, so there it is laid, right? That's Smith's little model. Okay, it's not, I mean, it's not all of it, but it's the bones of it. It's the skeleton of it. All right. <clears throat> this process, according to Smith, is limited by these three things that I just talked about. Geography, technology, population. Right? So the process of, of, of wealth generation is the liberation of uh, individuals to pursue their self-interests. Um, but ultimately that pursuit is limited by a variety of forces, in, including some that are mitigatable, like technology, right? So you, you, can, you can encourage more technological development, and, and some of which are unavoidable, like geography, okay? Um, if you're very isolated from, from other peoples, and, and it's a very, on an island somewhere far away, your, your possibilities for economic development are, are far poorer than if you're on a large land mass with a lot of people or on a land mass that has easy navigatable sea routes to other populations. All right, that's the beginnings of Smith of Adam Smith. Remember, this is this is like the 1770s, right? This is a long time ago. Um, it, it's a pretty cool little piece of reasoning, right? I, I think. I think maybe, maybe maybe you're like this is boring, right? I don't, I don't know, right? But to me, like, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's 
pretty clever stuff. I hope you think so too. Anyway, we'll leave it there and we'll pick it up again uh, next time. All right, see you there.